As soon as Father got them both onto his citizens of access, they began testing the waters. They stayed away from the nets that required use of a real name. That wasn't hard because real names only had to do with money. They didn't need money. They needed respect and that they could earn. With false names on the right nets, they could be anybody. Old men, middle-aged women, anybody. As long as they were careful about the way they wrote. All that anyone would see were their words, their ideas. Every citizen started equal on the nets. They used throwaway names with their early efforts, not the identities that Peter planned to make famous and influential. Of course, they were not invited to take part in the great national and international political forums. They could only be audiences there until they were invited or elected to take part. But they signed on and watched, reading some of the essays published by the great names, witnessing the debates that played across their desks. And in the lesser conferences where common people commented about the great debates, they began to insert their comments. At first, Peter insisted that they be deliberately inflammatory. We can't learn how our style of writing is working unless we get responses. And if we're bland, no one will answer. They were not bland. And people answered. The responses that got posted on the public nets were vinegar. The responses that were sent as mail for Peter and Valentine to read privately were poisonous. But they did learn what attributes of their writing were sized up as childish and immature. And they got better. When Peter was satisfied that they knew how to sound adult, he killed the old identities and they began to prepare to attract real attention. We have to seem completely separate. We'll write about different things at different times. We'll never refer to each other. You'll mostly work on the West Coast nets and I'll mostly work in the South. Regional issues too. So do your homework. They did their homework. Mother and father worried sometimes, with Peter and Valentine constantly together, their desks tucked under their arms. But they couldn't complain. Their grades were good, and Valentine was such a good influence on Peter. She had changed his whole attitude toward everything. And Peter and Valentine sat together in the woods in good weather, and in pocket restaurants and indoor parks when it rained. And they composed their political commentaries. Peter carefully designed both characters, so neither one had all of his ideas. There were even some spare identities that they used to drop in third-party opinions. Let both of them find a following as they can, said Peter. Once, tired of writing and rewriting until Peter was satisfied, Val despaired and said, Write it yourself, then. I can't. He answered, they both, they can't both sound alike, ever. You forget that someday we'll be famous enough that somebody will start running analysis. We have to come up as different people every time. So she wrote on. Her main identity on the nets was Demosthenes. Peter chose the name. He called himself Locke. They were obvious pseudonyms, but that was part of the plan. With any luck, they'll start trying to guess who we are. If we get famous enough, the government can always get access and find out who we really are. When that happens, we'll be too entrenched to suffer much loss. People might be shocked that Demosthenes and Locke are two kids, but they'll already be used to listening to us. They began composing debates for their characters. Valentine would prepare an opening statement, and Peter would invent a throwaway name to answer her. His answer would be intelligent, and the debate would be lively. Lots of clever invective and good political rhetoric. Valentine had a knack for alliteration that made her phrases memorable. Then they would enter the debate into the network, separated by a reasonable amount of time, as if they were actually making them up on the spot. Sometimes a few other netters would interpose comments, but Peter and Val would usually ignore them or change their own comments only slightly to accommodate what had been said. Peter took careful note of all their most memorable phrases and then did searches for time to time to find those phrases cropping up in other places. Not all of them did, but most of them were repeated here and there, and some of them even showed up in the major debates on the prestige nets. We're being read, Peter said. The ideas are seeping out. The phrases, anyway. That's just the measure. Look, we're having some influence. Nobody quotes us by name yet, but they're discussing the points we raise. We're helping set the agenda. We're getting there. Should we try and get into the main debates? No, we'll wait until they ask us. 
They had been doing it only seven months when one of the West Coast Nets sent Demosthenes a message, an offer for a weekly column in a pretty good news net. I can't do a weekly column, Valentine said. I don't even have a monthly period yet. The two aren't related, Peter said. They are to me. I'm still a kid. Tell them yes, but since you prefer not to have your true identity revealed, you want them to pay you in network time. A new access code through their corporate identity. So when the government traces me, you'll just be a person who can sign on through CalNet. Father Citizen's access doesn't get involved. What I can't figure out is why they wanted Demosthenes before Locke. Talent rises to the top. As a game, it was fun, but Valentine didn't like some of the positions Peter made Demosthenes take. Demosthenes began to develop as a fairly paranoid anti-Russian writer. It bothered her because Peter was the one who knew how to ex exploit fear in his writing. She had to keep coming to him for ideas on how to do it. Meanwhile, his lock followed her moderate, emphatic strategies. It made sense, in a way. By having her write Demosthenes, it meant he also had some, some empathy, just as Locke also ha could play on other spheres. But the main effect was to keep her inextricably tied to Peter. She couldn't go off and use Dem Demosthenes for her own purposes. She wouldn't know how to use him. Still, it worked both ways. He couldn't write Locke without her. Or could he? I thought the idea was to unify the world. If I write this like you say I should, Peter, I'm pretty much calling for war to break up the Warsaw Pact. Not war, just open nets and prohibition of interception, free flow of information, compliance with the league rules for heaven's sake. Without meaning to, Valentine started talking in Demosthenes' voice, even though she certainly wasn't speaking Demosthenes' opinions. Everyone knows that from the beginning of the League, the Second Warsaw Pact was to be regarded as a single entity, where those rules were concerned. International free flow is still open, but whatever the Warsaw Pact nations, these things are internal matters. That was why they were willing to allow American hegemony in the League. You're arguing Locke's part, Val. Trust me. You have to call for the Warsaw Pact to lose official status. You have to get a lot of people really angry. Then, later, when you begin to recognize the need for compromise, then they stop listening to me and go off and fight a war. Val, trust me, I know what I'm doing. How do you know? You're not any smarter than me, and you've never done this before either. I'm 13 and you're 10. Almost 11. And I know how these things work. All right. I'll do it your way. But I won't do any of these liberty or death things. You will too. And someday when they catch us and they wonder why your sister was such a warmonger, I can just bet you'll tell them that you told me to do it. Are you sure you're not having a period, little woman? I hate you, Peter Wiggin. What bothered Valentine most was when her column got syndicated into several other regional news nets and father started reading it and quoting it from at the table. Finally, a man with some sense, he said. Then he quoted some of the passages Valentine hated worst in her own work. It's fine to work with these hegemonist Russians with the buggers out there, but after we win, I can't see leaving half the civilized world as virtual serfs in the Russian Empire, can you, dear? I think you're taking this all too seriously, said Mother. I like this Demosthenes. I like the way he thinks. I'm surprised he isn't in the major nets. I looked for him in the international relations debate, and you know... He's never taken part in any of them. Valentine lost her appetite and left the table. Peter followed her after a respectable interval. Interval. So you don't like lying to father, he said. So what? You're not not lying to him. He doesn't think that you're really Demosthenes. And Demosthenes isn't saying anything you believe. They cancel each other out. They don't amount to nothing. That's the kind of reasoning that makes Locke such an ass. But what really bothered her was not that she was lying to father. It was the fact that father actually agreed with Demosthenes. She had thought that only fools would follow him. 
A few days later, Locke got picked up for a column in a New England newsnet, specifically to provide a contrasting view for her popular column from Demosthenes. Not bad for two kids who've only got about eight pubic hairs between them, Peter said. It's a long way between writing a newsnet column and ruling the world, Valentine reminded him. It's such a long way that no one has ever done it. They have, though, or the moral equivalent. I'm going to say snide things about Demosthenes in my very first column. Well, Demosthenes isn't even going to notice that Locke exists. Ever. For now. With their identities now fully supported by their income from writing columns, they used father's access now only for the throwaway identities. Mother commented that they were spending too much time on the net. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, she reminded Peter. Peter let his hand tremble a little and he said, If you think I should stop, I think I might be able to keep things under control this time. I really do. No, no. Mother said, I don't want you to stop. Just be careful, that's all. I'm careful, Mom. Nothing was different. Nothing had changed in a year. Ender was sure of it, and yet it all seemed to have gone sour. He was still the leading soldier in the standings, and no one doubted that he deserved it now. At the age of nine, he was a toon leader in Phoenix Army, with Petra Arcanian as his commander. He still led his evening practice sessions. Now they were attended by an elite group of soldiers nominated by their commanders, though any launchy who wanted to come still could. Alay was also a tune leader in another army, and they were still good friends. Shen was not a leader, but that was no barrier. Dink Meeker was finally accepted command and succeeded Rose the Nose in Rat's army command. All is going well, very well. I couldn't ask for anything better. So why do I hate my life? He went through the paces of the practices and games. He liked teaching the boys in his tune, and they followed him loyally. He had the respect of everyone, and he was treated with deference in his evening practices. Commanders came to study what he did. Other soldiers approached his table at mess and asked permission to sit down. Even the teachers were respectful. He had so much damn respect, he wanted to scream. He watched for young kids in Petra's army, fresh out of their launch groups. Watched how they played how they made fun of their leaders when they thought no one was looking. He watched the camaraderie of old friends who had known each other in battle school for years, who talked and laughed about old battles and long graduated soldiers and commanders. But with his old friends, there was no laughter, no remembering, just work, just intelligence and excitement about the game, but nothing beyond that. Tonight it had come to a head in the evening practice. Ender and Alay were discussing the nuances of open space maneuvers when Shen came up and listened for a few moments, then suddenly took Alay by the shoulders and shouted, Nova, Nova, Nova! Alay burst out laughing, and for a moment or two, Ender watched them remember together the battle where opening, open room maneuvering had been for real, and they had dodged past the older boys, and suddenly they remembered Ender was there. Sorry, Ender, Shen said. Sorry? For what? For being friends? I was there too, you know, Ender said. And they apologized again, back to business, back to respect. And Ender realized that in their laughter, in their friendship, it had not occurred to them that he could have been included. How could they think I was part of it? Did I laugh? Did I join in? Just stood there watching like a teacher. That's how they think of me too. Teacher, legendary soldier, not one of them. Not someone that you embrace and whisper salam in his ear. That only lasted while Ender still seemed a victim, still seemed vulnerable. Now he was the master soldier and he was completely, utterly alone. Feel sorry for yourself, Ender. He typed the words on his desk as he lay on his bunk. Poor Ender. Then he laughed at himself and cleared away the words. Not a boy or girl in this school who wouldn't be glad to trade places with me. He called it the fantasy game. He walked as he often did through the village that the dwarves had built in the hill made by the giant's corpse. It was easy to build sturdy walls with the ribs already curved just right, just enough space between them to leave windows. The whole corpse was cut into apartments, opening into the path down the giant's spine. 
The public amphitheater was carved into the pelvic bowl, and the common herd of ponies was pastured between gi the giant's legs. Ender was never sure what the dwarves were doing as they went about their business, but they left him alone as he picked his way through the village, and in return he did them no harm either. He vaulted the pelvic bone at the base of the p public square and walked through the pasture. The ponies shied away from him. He did not pursue them. Ender did not understand how the game functioned anymore. In the old days, before he had first gone to the end of the world, everything was combat and puzzles to solve. Defeat the enemy before he kills you or figure out how to get past the obstacle. Now, though, no one attacked. There was no war. And whatever, wherever he went, there was no obstacle at all. Except, of course, in the room in the castle at the end of the world. It was the one dangerous place left, and Ender, however often he vowed that he would not, always went back there, always killed the snake, always looked at his brother in the face, and always, no matter what he did next, died. It was no different this time. He tried to use the knife on the table to pry through the mortar and pull out a stone from the wall. As soon as he breached the seal of the mortar, water began to gush in through the crack, and Ender watched his desk as his figure, now out of his control, struggled madly to stay alive, to keep from drowning. The windows of this room were gone. The water rose, and his figure drowned. All the while, the face of Peter Wigan in the mirror stayed and looked at him. I'm trapped here. Ender thought, trapped at the end of the world with no way out. And he knew at last the sour taste that had come to him, despite all his successes in the battle room. It was despair. <laughs>